the perfect app. Shooting Missing was a dream come true. Storm is just the perfect actress to play June because she not only brings this range of emotion, but she's so much fun to watch. This is a film that younger audiences are gonna really connect to in a large part because of Storm and what she brings to the character. I'm not giving up on my mom. It's all making sense. When we found out that there was mutual interest, that was extremely exciting, and she immediately became the person we wanted to develop this project around. Please do me a favor and clear your voicemail. I've been trying to leave you messages. Well, they're probably all from you. Here we go, guys. Ready and action. June as a character is a very vulnerable person. She has a lot of layers to herself. She puts on a front, especially with her mother. I am with whatever you need. I don't need a babysitter. When her mom goes missing, we actually see the real inner child within her, and that's something that Storm does beautifully. Please, it's my mom. Storm brings this gravitas to every scene, but at the same time can also just be a teenager. And it's this really unique mix. She has the ability to go in and out of her life, cut, and it's like talking to the friends and acting like a normal kid, and then can come in and just slay you emotionally. <laughs> June starts to freak out about her mom. No, 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 hey, let us out! Thankfully, I've been blessed to be able to access my emotions quickly. No, no, no. The hard thing is like staying in it and having to do it repeatedly. <laughs> All right, all right, okay. all right, let's go. The ability to get in touch with her emotions and portray them in nuanced ways was just incredible. She brings a depth to the character that transcends what we wrote on the page. Cool, got it, got it. Cool, that's good. How'd that feel? Good. For an actress of such a young age, she's really kind of a veteran. But no matter what sorts of experience she had, Nothing could kind of prepare her for the difficulties of shooting something like this. We basically shot this entire movie on the computer, <laughs> which was really challenging and something that I had never done before. All right, I need your help. I'm used to having cameras, having a camera, having a B camera, and, and working with other actors, and I didn't really get much of that. And you get on set, and what you're looking at is a laptop with lights around it, and you're like, okay, action. And that can be very confusing and alienating for a lot of actors, but they have no idea how they're doing. And it takes a lot of trust and a lot of talent to be able to pull something with this much range off for so long. Her performance, it carries the film from frame one to frame whatever the movie ends on. It was definitely the toughest thing I've done in my career so far. Call 911. It was very technical and I had to memorize different eye lines with different scenes. There's a lot of times where she is using the computer and her eyeline has to track. So we found the best thing to do is actually create folders on the desktop and name the folder the name of what she's looking at when. So she would look from one folder to another and we're like, while you look at this one, you're thinking, oh my God, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. Who did this? She's hitting her lines, hitting the emotion and nailing these like crazy bizarre eyelines. She was incredibly flexible and open to the process and she trusted us to help her navigate something that was, I'm sure, really frustrating and challenging. You should just go. And that trust, I think, translated into something really, really great. Peace, amiga. Hmm? Peace. That's a big wrap on that. We really put Storm through the ringer, and honestly, I couldn't be prouder. This has been the most challenging project I've been on in my almost 15 years of acting. At the ending of Searching, there's a line that John Cho says as David Kim, when he realizes that there's potentially still a chance that his daughter may be alive, and that line is, there was a storm on Monday. I went home every day thanking uh, my lucky stars to be on this project, so thank you guys. I'm super excited. When we cast Storm, it all clicked. What? Nothing. Just thank you. Hi, this is Grace Allen. Please leave a message. Mom? I fell in love with missing because of searching. It still retains the intimacy of the first installment because of the technological structure of it, but it has a much more expansive purview in terms of storytelling. It's bigger, there's even more twists and turns in the first one. We threw a lot more tech on the screen. The thrills are that much more. The whole film is constantly twist upon twist upon twist. 
Miss Allen, we may have found them. When I was reading the script, I was like, oh my gosh, I wasn't expecting that. And then something else happens, I'm like, oh my gosh, I wasn't expecting that either. Why would she keep this from me? It requires you to use every part of your brain and it taps into all of your senses. Your brain is on 10. It's a huge maze of red herring. Sometimes we describe it as working on like a puzzle or a math problem. We started with the whiteboard. We wrote on there the word family. We scrawled twists and turns and thrills, the theme of connection and disconnection. Those are the core tenets. We've already done a father searching for his missing daughter. Why don't we just flip that dynamic? Just naturally have it be a child searching for a parent. Seven and Niche went off and they wrote an incredible outline. And we were tasked with translating those bullet points into character. You know you don't have to use Siri for literally everything, right? Listen, I need you to write a couple of things down. Emotion. <laughs> and making it all work on a screenplay level. Junior don't know what she's capable of. She lied to a judge to have me put in prison. So a lot of these misdirects are more than just faking you out with a red herring. They're playing into your own bias, your own way of seeing the world. I have a record. And trying to tell you something about how maybe the way you and the main character of the movie saw the world was wrong and led you to reach the wrong conclusions. It was real. On one hand, you want to try to subvert people's expectations and you want to keep things fresh and as a surprise, but then you don't want to go too far with it because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is emulate something that could happen in real life. You also want to make it an emotional journey for the protagonist and the audience. I've already lost one parent, Avi. I can't lose her too. Being able to pull both of those off is incredibly difficult, and we're lucky to work with a team of really great storytellers. All right, guys, we got that. We're moving outside. I love real life crime stories. I think we are tapping into figuring out mysteries, figuring out crimes. Audiences are really into true crime, especially like con stories, things that have to do with the internet. We've always had this fascination with this. What Missing is doing is taking that fascination and putting it into our phones, into our laptops, and into the devices that we use every day. This is June 27th, 10 p.m. at the office of Heather Demore. This movie engages more than Searching did with the popularity of the true crime genre and true crime recreations of stuff that really happened. We were writing this thinking it's kind of weird how prevalent this is and how it's kind of messed up, but also we kind of love it. Extreme Exclusive developments tonight in the case of Grace Allen. We're seeing the crime and what June is going through through the lens of the internet, which I think is one of the most fun aspects of these movies. We're all obsessed with true crime stories. We're all obsessed with stories about people using the internet to con others. She hired Lynn and the driver, stages the kidnapping. And the story of Missing is what happens if you find yourself right at the center of that and how do you get out of it. People have been obsessed with murder and kidnapping and scary things next door forever. We're just doing what Agatha Christie did in a very 21st century medium. I'm calling to report a missing person. Okay, who is this regarding? Searching, we had John Cho playing David Kim, who was a father looking for his missing daughter. He didn't quite understand the world of the internet. And so much of the fun of that movie, the obstacles that the character had to overcome, was him having to learn and navigate and understand social media and understand Venmo and things like that. We had a lot of jokes about how our main character, David, was not very tech savvy. And in a way, having a character that's not tech savvy helps you sort of teach the audience how each app is used. On Missing, we got to kind of flip the script and have June, who's 18, be the person doing the searching. Kevin Lynn, he was at your house June 8th. What was he doing there? Storm Reed's character, June, she is a teenager. So the obstacle is actually not the internet. There's definitely a difference between generations in terms of how we access information. My generation has grown up the majority of our lives with computers, with telephones, so we know how to work faster than our parents. Mom, Siri, please call Mom, June you're already on the phone, this is FaceTime. June's gift is she actually becomes a stronger investigator in the mystery than the actual authorities.
In this story, the unknown is not the internet. The unknown is what happened to her mother. We wanted to pick a protagonist that really knew how to use the apps, really knew what she was doing, because it was a cool way to not only trust like the audience more, but to challenge ourselves to show things on a computer screen that are a little more ambitious than you might have seen before. We're not gonna teach you anything. We're just gonna go kind of like 100 miles an hour right off the bat. The fact that June is so adept at the internet, she knows this world. The internet is actually her home and where she feels really herself. It actually ends up making the film that much more escalated because now the thrills are far greater, the obstacles are even harder, and the twists are way more numerous because June can handle it. Don't let them put you down. I think part of the fun of Missing is the playfulness with the audience, the fake outs, the surprises, and introducing a show within the show both gave us a great opportunity to pay homage to searching in a really fun way, but to also set up the ultimate little fake out, the ultimate playful twist at the very end. This is not a show, this is my mom. The challenge with Missing is to tell a movie that takes place entirely within computer screens, but not just to show a screen recording of your desktop. It's got to feel cinematic. Who are these people? Every single line of text that appears in this film, it's all customized. We've got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. It's a cacophony of social media. I cannot take this anymore. Scene 14, take three, Mark. Before we even started shooting a frame of actual principal photography, the directors, Will and Nick, made the entire movie starring themselves and starring their friends. And we ended up having an hour and a half, two hour cut of the entire film in a very sort of sketchy way. We wanted to know before we actually spent a dollar being on set with the real actor, where should the camera really be? We knew that if we actually designed everything beforehand, it would allow the actors to have that much more freedom on the day. Whoa, June, okay, you gotta chill with that girl. Sis, I'm this fine, is not, no, it's fine. This is not Nothing that you see is screen recorded. Everything in this movie is graphically designed and animated to give you the cleanest, most cinematic viewing experience possible. It actually was much more challenging in a lot of ways to make than a smaller live action movie would be. Every shot is essentially a VFX shot or an animated shot. Every notepad, every file date when you open up Finder, every time you open up Google and type something, all those drop downs when you start typing a search, every single frame of this movie is customized. The actual reality is that this is one of the most laborious, hair pulling kind of projects that I think any set of filmmakers anywhere could ever embark on. If she sets it down in one angle and you start running and then we jump got stuff behind her she hasn't even touched yet. Mom? Let me know when you get this. Every single year, there's a series of apps that come out. And what we realized by putting four years in between searching and missing was that we had heaps of apps and storytelling devices to tell missing on. This is FaceTime. Oh! I know, I know. I just put the phone down for a second. Mm -hmm. We live in a social media era. Everything is on our phones. All information is at the tip of our fingertips. So to be able to experience a movie where you're using all of the social media platforms that people usually use is so interesting. Every cinematic set piece is an app that you're familiar with and that you can relate to. There's text threads, there's emails, there's all kinds of alerts and pop-ups and photos, and there's a lot of Instagram involved. I need you to go to my Instagram and find a picture. I still don't see him. Javi, please hurry. And the last movie, Margot, the teenager who went missing, used Facebook mostly, and in this movie, our main character doesn't even have a Facebook, <laughs> because I don't think we know too many people that age who actually do. Oh, guess what? Your friend Javi friended me on Facebook. <laughs> For real? No way. By Making the story about a teenager, immediately the world of the internet opens up. She already has TikTok and Be Real and the way she uses iMessage and Venmo and Snapchat, these are second nature to her. And what she has to learn in the story is how to use those apps to find her mom as opposed to what those apps are. I need someone to get to the hotel and get the footage before it's erased so we can see when she and her boyfriend left. 
It's such a brilliant way to tell a story. You can move the action along with something as simple as you're watching her Venmo balance slowly diminish. Rather than shoot a montage about like, here's me physically spending money, you're able to just instantly translate that and that's all you need. When I stop and think about how much we depend on our phones, the ring cams, our computers, FaceTime, it really is just the way of the world. We're actually seeing through the storytelling the way that most of us are living now. It's a very 2023 version of searching, and I think it really works. And action. Summer break! Woo! Where is she? We have an insane amount of Easter eggs. Making a movie like this, you get to spend a lot of time on each frame, and you get to think a lot about who you want to give shout outs to what little inside jokes you want to make, and potentially what sorts of storylines you want to tell in the background of the frame, if you look closely enough. And yes, my mom is in the movie. <laughs>
Here in Kevin's emails, you can see that Kevin fixed June's laptop. We wanted to set up the idea that maybe Kevin got in to install this spyware software. The internet is descending on Grace Allen, and one person tweets that they worked with somebody who looked suspiciously like her in Texas, which is actually where Grace lived. So this person knew her back when she was Sarah. This little text that you can see on the bottom left of the screen, that's a reference to producer Sev Ohanian. We had this identical Easter egg in searching where this character named Sev Ohanian accurately predicts the ending. So this is Sev actually ruining the entire rest of the movie. One of the really cool things was to put some Easter eggs into Missing that followed up on some of the characters that we saw in Searching. We hid an email from a weed delivery company. The founder and CEO of the company is actually Peter Kim, and he's the brother of David Kim, who was revealed to be sharing marijuana with his niece Margo in that film. There's a very brief glimpse of an ad in the sidebar. It's a game that's being played between the San Jose Vins and the St. Louis Notes. If you remember, Peter Kim was a really big fan of Vins in the first film. So over here, we're seeing the T commentator, Abigail Nielsen. In searching, Abigail was Margot Kim's classmate who claimed to be Margot's friend only after Margot went missing. Abby was using Margot so that she could get into Berkeley. The always gossiping Abigail did not get into Berkeley, but has instead found her calling as a commentator for the online publication, The T. The guy on the right is actually an actor named Thomas Barbuska, who's continuing the same exact role he played in Searching, where he briefly pops up on David Kim's screen. For the alien invasion storyline, June has a Reddit window open in the background. There's some chatter about a conspiracy about alien life. On Twitter, people are taking pictures about this abandoned mall and that there potentially was not a gas leak with the hashtag Area 52 hashtag cover up. June's friend Tia is even texting her about this girl who was in the mall that collapsed. This is a character who's gonna be a major part of the Easter egg journey. And we realize that this teenager who was exploring that abandoned mall when it collapsed is still out there. And we also see figures spotted leaping from rooftops as I see in an article. On Google, we have a CNN page that announces a travel advisory in Baltimore due to a power outage. There is an article about a contractor who claimed to have seen a green energy field in an abandoned mall. We see a space-oriented newsletter that has the headline, Green Light May Alter DNA. We see another blink or you'll miss it moment where a Baltimore storm is caused by aliens. We also see for the first time, hashtag Green Angel, what's starting to become the name of this teenage girl who got these alien powers. More instances of the Green Angel using her powers to really protect the people. We are really starting to see that the authorities are not necessarily on the same side as Green Angel. We see in Kevin's inbox, a really quick headline, breaking manhunt underway for Green Angel. Over here we see protesters gather following arrest of Green Angel vigilante, showing that the police did capture the Green Angel. Here in, on this one patrol sequence, we actually see written in Spanish, Angel Verde nos salvara, which translates to Green Angel will save us. We see very briefly the headline, Green Angel escapes, who helped her? And more importantly, we see another one that says they are back, did they come back for her? In this moment, as Javi is on his phone trying to desperately help June, we see a very quick trending search in Spanish, Angel versus Extraterrestres and Vivo, meaning it's Green Angel versus the aliens live. So it tells us that at this exact moment, while June and Grace are fighting for their lives, there's some kind of climactic battle happening between the Green Angel and the aliens. And in the final moments of the movie, we see on June's desktop a file that says, could Green Angel have survived? implying that potentially she did survive this final encounter with the aliens. So we showed you so many Easter eggs, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. So pause, freeze frame, dig around, try to find them all. The sequence you're about to watch took place in a very different version of the third act of our movie. So originally, June and her mom are thrown into the same room together and piece together the mystery of the movie in a revelation sequence, a lot like what we had in the first Searching. And while we really loved the simplicity and the tone of this alternate third act, what we found was that there was a bit of a contrivance of why June and Grace were being thrown in the same room, and it felt a little talky. So we rewrote the entire third act in order to make it a little bit more driven by action. So here's a little glimpse into a very different version of this movie's third act. We do like it, but ultimately, we chose the action-packed ending.
I just knew that I had to get him out of your life. But what does he want? I don't understand. He's crazy, June. He wanted to keep me here as revenge for what I did to him. So that's why he hired Kevin. To make it look like you disappeared. Just get off the grid, do a hard reset. Because no one would suspect him if it happened in another country. No one except Heather. She was the only other person who knew what he did to me. Oh my God. He killed her before she could tell me the truth. Exclusive developments tonight. But then I found out anyway. A ground search begins at the FBI. Large withdrawals from Miss Allen's bank account. He knew I was about to find him. That's why he brought me here. What's he going to do to us now? I don't know. What you're about to watch is a storyboarded version of our villain's downfall. In this version, James doesn't die, but is captured by the police while trying to escape from the cabin with June. And we see it all in the Netflix Unfiction recreation. We really liked this scene because it's action-packed and it answers some questions of what exactly James was trying to do with June. But ultimately, we never decided to shoot this because we thought it would be disappointing to see our villain taken down in something that is ultimately a fake like recreation. Also, some people watching these storyboards became so invested in the sequence itself that they were disappointed by the reveal it was a TV show. But here it is for your enjoyment. Hey, Siri. Call 911. Distress call at 48541 Mariposa Road, Mountain Springs. Any units in the area, please report immediately. Head to the area now. Unit 270, also reporting. I'm about two miles out from the area. What's your ETA? Can you hear me? She's not breathing. We need an ambulance now.